tell Tony it's some real money in the room. We here on the Bob Report in Fort Worth, Texas, and we got the legendary brother Weasel. How you doing, man? I'm doing fine today, young man. That's I'm kind of like, like, what you call it? Just sitting and chilling. Yeah. And uh, I owe you a favor. Okay. I owe you a favor because you done something for me and you also put me on a chart okay. and said that I was number one of with all the wisdom and the wise and things like that. I didn't know you, neither did you know me. But sure. some kind of way you put me on that chart and you got me, you know, saying that I'm the wise as it is and which a fool can't be wise. <laughs> My job is to answer your questions that you have. Okay, Pops. So tell us, the people who don't know, where you from? And Say it you, again, where I'm what? Where are you from, Pops? Where am I from? Yes, sir. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm from the universe. I go everywhere, but I'm, I was born and raised in Fort Worth. Gotcha. Went to school in Fort Worth. Went to Wilder College. Went to the Army. Had fun on every side of town. I could go to every side of town back that end. I just couldn't get caught in Polly or Hanley or Meadowbrook. Why? It was racism then. Polly belonged to white folks. Hanley belonged to white folks. So you can't get caught in those neighborhoods. You had to just stay at certain parts of Stop Six or certain parts of Side Side, certain parts of Riverside, certain parts of North Side. North Side was considered blacks and Mexicans, a few whites. Lake Como was a few whites and blacks in Lake Como. It was segregated then. Stop six was all black, one Mexican family. One Hispanic family in Stop Six. Huh? Just one Mexican family. Yeah, in one family. Mexican family was in Stop Six when I was a little boy. It was the Gomez's family. Gomez's. How was how was Fort Worth as a whole when you saying that Polly was you know, majority of white people, so was Hanley. The other parts were black. How was it as far as the racism? How bad was the racism then? Racism was like you knew what side you supposed to be on, so you stay on that side. If a white boy get caught on black side, he get his ass whooped just like a get caught on white side and get his ass whooped too. Same thing, racism was you have your side, we got our side. Our Italians had their side, the Jews had their side, the whites had their side, the blacks had their side. When Dr. King said let's integrate and the blacks fought for integration, then it became where you can go wherever you want to go in the 60s. So in the 60s it was kind of open up to where we can go where we want to go. But from the 60s on, you had to just stay in your area. I was raised sort of like on 9th Street downtown, 4th Street, Southside, Stop 6, you know, like that. You, so you, you grew up all over Fort Worth? Yeah, I grew up all over Fort Worth. Back that end, we didn't have no boundaries for blacks. Blacks went wherever they wanted to go in the black neighborhood. Like now, a fella from Stop Six, he can't go to Southside. Mm -hmm. Or a fella from Stop Six, he can't go to Lake Como. They have different sides now. Blacks got it where it's racism now for, for the young black boys. A young black boy that live on the side side, if he get caught in Stop Six with the wrong colors on, he gonna get beat up. Which you should be able to go wherever you want to go. Cause this, this America, America you can go wherever you want to go. So now, Pops, the, the blacks are just demonstrating racism against other blacks. No, blacks didn't have racism against other blacks. Racism started, racism started with blacks with the gang bangers, the Crips and the Bloods. Gotcha. It wasn't no racism amongst blacks. Blacks love one another. You are a Negro, you're a Negro, you're Afro-American, you know which one you were, you know which one you, you know. But it wasn't no racism amongst blacks. Blacks didn't, blacks looked out for one another back that end. The blacks just started crossing one another in 83 in Texas. 
in California, I guess, blacks fought blacks every day up there. I don't know. But in Texas, blacks then start fighting blacks until Crips and Bloods hit Fort Worth. And then all of a sudden, the young boys from the side side can't come to Stop 6. The boys from Stop 6 can't go to side side, north side, and things like that. Before before gangs pop, um, what was the vibe like in Fort Worth? It was a money town, hustlers. Um. Fort Worth was a... Uh, Fort Worth was a... Uh, what we call cow town. It was a party town. Monday, Blue Mondays and things like that. Fort Worth was a town where everybody went to work. Everybody had jobs back then. And you didn't have game banging. Little boys had jobs. They worked at car washes. They worked at grocery stores, cutting meat, sacking groceries and things. And everybody had some money back then. There wasn't no drugs. We didn't sell drugs in the 60s and the 50s. The drugs didn't hit Texas until around about 69 or 70. Hmm. When the drugs hit, how did that? affect the city of Fort Worth for the blacks? Drugs was the economy for blacks. Hmm. Believe it or not, it was bad to sell drugs because you, you know, but to blacks, that's the only way blacks ever had any money in Fort Worth was selling drugs. So when we started selling drugs, we started having money. We opened up places of business, you know, and things like that. We didn't have to go to work. Some of us didn't have to go to work. Some of us picked up that dope sack and went to selling dope. And when you went to selling dope, you buy the state. You keep your enough money to buy the state. But when the Fed gets you, you can't buy the Fed. You're going to jail. So Fed you, don't want no money. You, you, you make enough money from the dope to buy the, the state. You can't buy the Fed with your money. No, you can't buy the Fed. I don't care how much money you got. You can't billionaires be trying to buy the Fed. You can't buy the Fed. They got all the money and they got all the land, so your ass is going to jail. <laughs> now, the state, you, if you don't kill a white boy, you can get out of jail if you got money because white folks is like that. If the kid were back that end, you could kill three or four blacks, you ain't going to jail. They didn't start sending blacks to jail and still the game banging started. But a long time ago, you can kill two or three blacks, you ain't going to jail. As long as you got some money, get that lawyer some money. You, you spoke on, um, you know, you went to college. Did you, did you also go to the military? After I come back from college, I went to the military. I went to college and stayed a year, but I wasn't college material. I didn't like college. I didn't like playing football, so I didn't go back to college. I went to the military. And when I went to the military, then I come back home and tried to figure out what to do. What do I want to do? So I just went, wow. What, 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 what part of the world did the military take you to, Pops? I got a chance to go to Vietnam. I got a chance to go to Hawaii. I got a chance to go to Hong Kong, but I spent my duty in Vietnam. How was that? How was that? Yes, sir. It's undescribable. It's, you, you, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. So it's undescribable. If you wasn't there, then you can't understand. I thought when I first went to Vietnam in the 60s, I thought it was dinosaurs over there. I had never seen nothing so pretty before in my life. Just pretty and green. And it rang all day and it rang all night. Called monsoon season. Um, so being in Vietnam, you, you saw people actually get killed in the in combat. It's something that you don't discuss. Yes, sir. Yeah, what you saw in Vietnam and what you had to do in Vietnam when you come home, you try to lead that over there. But that's a hell of a, it was a hell of a thing for a young man to go through. Any young man that go through service and go through a war zone, that's a hell of a thing for him to go through. Then when you come home, then hear this white boy riding down you, the white police riding down you, trying to whoop you. Well, you're a soldier, you ain't gonna just let the police whoop you, you're gonna fight the police back. Cause you know how to fight like the police know how to fight. So when you came back from Vietnam, you get back in Fort Worth, you say you went wow. Yeah, mama wanted me to go back to school. My grandmother wanted me to go back to school. I didn't want to go to school, so I tried little old jobs and things like that, but I always kept me a place of business. I kept me a shoe shine parlor, 
because I used to shine shoes. So I had me a shoe shine parlor where I played pool in there, we shoot dice in there, we play poker in there. Because I worked when I was a little boy, so I don't feel like giving nobody eight hours of my time for a dollar and a quarter hour or two dollars an hour. Because back then in the 60s, you didn't make no more than a dollar and a quarter hour. So me, I thought I was sharp enough that I ain't got to go to work for nobody. I can open up my own place of business and work for myself. And that mindset led you to opening the Classy Lady, a legendary spot in Fort Worth, Texas. I had a place before Classy Lady. I had a place called Texas Nick Texas on the corner of Evans and Rose there. Okay. Yes, I was. I opened up a place of business on the corner of Erie and Rose there, and I called it Texas Nick. And we just enjoyed ourselves down there, had fun, sold dope because we thought selling dope was legal. You know, it's a way to have some money. And then Nixon was the president. He should leave them niggas alone, rest the Italians, and let the blacks just sell dope. So we sold dope until about the uh, 70s or the 80s when parole introduced the DEA agent. Hmm. Fed didn't hardly bother us about dope. The state didn't really know nothing about the dope because the state always run us for gambling and bootlegging and pimping. Back that end, you gamble, you bootleg, you pimp, or you're a burglar. Back that end, you know, and things like that. Then all of a sudden, the dope come in, and when the dope come in, everybody, you know, thought it was legal. So everybody got them some dope and went to selling some dope and went to having some money. Then all of a sudden, Nixon told them to leave them blacks alone and go arrest them Italians, you know. So everybody went to having money when Nixon was the president. But then all of a sudden, parole over in Dallas, or somebody started the DEA agent in Dallas. So when they started the DEA agent in Dallas, then that's when we all started going to the federal penitentiary for selling dope. So would, would that be the war against drugs? That was started the war against drugs? Nancy Riggins and Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan started to think war on drugs in America. Nixon didn't have war on drugs. Nixon, you know, he had war on Italians, all the Italians that had made the money over here in America and went back home. He sent his feds to go get them. He didn't care nothing about us blacks having no money, selling no dope. But when Reagan and uh, his wife got in there, and they put war on drugs. So when they put war on drugs, that mean war on us niggas too, because we selling that dope. Yeah. You had the Texas n um as a place of business. And then you had the Classy Lady, um, which most people in Fort Worth and the surrounding cities know about the Classy Lady. I opened Classy Lady in 2005. Mm -hmm. 2005 was designed to just be a place like Oklahoma where you come and play poker and you come and shoot craps and you come and get you some good food and you come and mind your business. But some kind of way Classy Lady being in Stop 6, uh, what you call a tradition building to people where the was a club because they always had it as a club so therefore they thought that they could make classy lady out of a club but i had to argue and fight with them to tell them that this is not a club this is where you come and lay a bit you come and shoot crafts and you come and play poker and you come and eat and enjoy yourself you don't come down here to party gamble get drunk and act a goddamn Food. But I was in what you call zero tolerant area, zero tolerance zone. The city of Fort Worth called from 8th Avenue all the way to 820, zero tolerance. That mean everybody from 820, from 8th Avenue to 820 was ignorant. From 8th Avenue to University, you got a little sense. Now they got it where in Fort Worth from Alp, from from Arab to 8th Avenue is pretty decent now, but from Arab all the way to 820 is still ignorant mm. because that's where the blacks live and the blacks don't have no businesses and the blacks done been invaded. Mexicans, Chinese, Vietnamese, and everybody got places of business in our neighborhood now. And that's, not, that's our fault. It's nobody's fault but ours. But when we integrated, then nobody want to come to a black business. So all black businesses closed. And now the foreigners done come over here and open up all the black areas, the old buildings that we had. 
do you think that's do you feel like that's because they have unity within their race and we don't we are not business hmm. point blank the new generation is not business. The old blacks was business. They had their own businesses and things like that. But when we integrated, they lost their businesses. And then we, we as being black, we can go around white folks' restaurants, Italians' restaurants, Chinese restaurants. We can go to other restaurants now because it's integration. One while when it was integration, we couldn't go to, when it was segregated, we couldn't go to a steakhouse. We still could always go to a spaghetti house. We could always go eat with the Italians. The Italians, they play like that they racist, but they wasn't really racist yeah. because they wanted our money. But the mm. white boy didn't even want our money. Mm. I've heard you um, mention uh, boy, been raising boy. There are no men in our present, in our culture right now. From from 1983, from 1983 in Fort Worth, Texas, not taking nothing from the men that was in Fort Worth, Texas that was trying to raise the boys and help the boys, but there wasn't no strong men, no more boys went to fooling with boys. Boys didn't have no daddies in the house some kind of way. From the 80s all the way up to now, I have, from the 60s, we had men in the house with mama. Now ain't nobody in the house with mama, so that's boys raising boys. When a boy leave out of the house with his mama, he go outdoors and find another boy to go to fooling with. So that's boys raising boys. Men ain't been, we didn't have no black businesses where the little boys can go around the tie shop and learn how to change tires, or where we had car washes where the little boys can go and learn to wash cars with men's mm -hmm. because the black men didn't have no business so when the little boys come out those ain't no men's out there to teach them nothing so boys been raising boys okay the classy lady is is present you know it's a it's a factor in fort worth and you meet a a young man named charleston white comes to your place of business what was the first thing you thought when you met brother charleston I try not to speak on another individual, mm -hmm. but Charleston White, what to me, he was an advocate. Charleston White come to help the children's and look out for the children's. Well, when Charleston White was down at Classy Lady, he found a lot of things to fool with and things like that because he's an advocate and he speak on what he see that's wrong. When he see something wrong, he speak on it. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's because he's an advocate, that's what he do. And he come to classy lady, and when he come to classy lady, he should pop, I'm gonna feed these children, I'm gonna clothe these children. I should boy, quit lying to me. And he did what he said he's gonna do. He fed them kids and he clothed them kids. And I asked Pops because um, us in Fort Worth, we know uh, that a lot of the knowledge, um, not taking nothing away from Charleston, but a lot of the knowledge comes from him sitting, talking to you every day. Where he got his knowledge from, nobody will never know. He didn't get it from me. How can he get his knowledge from me and I don't have no knowledge? He didn't get his knowledge from me. He already had his knowledge. He might have got a little ghetto knowledge from me, but the young man is highly educated. So he, he didn't get no educated knowledge from me. He was already educated. And the way that Charleston White used to speak to white folks is the way that Ned Turner and he, Charleston White is a rebellious person. He don't, you know, he don't listen to nothing nobody say. He got his own mind. And I don't like speaking on him. And mm -hmm. I don't like speaking on no man. So try not to ask me no questions about Charleston White. Ask me some questions about Classy Lady. Okay. This interview is not about Charleston White. No. Yeah. Okay, Pops. <laughs> You gotta have sharks in the black, in the neighbor, in the blacks, in the black, the black tribe don't know what a man is because it ain't no men's to been around to show them what a man is. And men's, men's are, ooh, it's, it's, it's real strong. Just like my hero, my hero is Castro. Why is Castro my hero? Because he booked the United States. 
and he challenged the United States. I like people that challenge the United States. The black man don't challenge the United States. The only person that the black man can try to challenge is his wife and his baby. The black man don't mm. manufacture nothing. He don't produce nothing. He don't grow nothing. The black man don't even have no knowledge to know who he is. We're slave descent with no knowledge of who we are. Whites know who whites are. Mexicans know who Mexicans are. Indians know who Indians are. The black race have no knowledge of who they are. So if you don't have no knowledge of who you are and you steady following, you're following the English white boy. So how can you be a man and you follow another person and believe in what they say and what they do? So me, I don't know where this come from. I don't know where this come from. You told me to go to reading this book. You told me that. You told me to go to reading this book. So pop read the Bible <laughs> and try to tell me about the Bible. Well, when I went to reading the Bible, I read about tribes. I read about nations. I read about the Jews. I read about the Palestinians. I read about the Romans. And I read about the Chinese and all of that. That's their culture. I'm in a culture over here in America that don't even know who I am and don't even have my name. We don't even have our names. The white folks sold us to different, from different plantations to different plantations. And we wind up with the white man's name. And right today, here we are with what they call it, what they call it, uh, family reunions. Man, I'm the prices. Man, I'm the prices. That was a white boy's name. That's not my name. How can I wear that name or how can I claim that name and I find out the truth? When you find out the truth, you can't live like, you can't live like the average man. Colin Powell said, I am not a Negro. Colin Powell said, I come from the West Indies to Jamaica from Jamaica to America, and I come to America to get the highest paying job. He thought he could just be a little lieutenant. All he wanted to be was a lieutenant. He wound up being a five star. But he said, I'm not a bro. I didn't come over here on change. Obama said, I'm not a bro. I didn't come over here on change. Negroes changed from nigga to Negro. Negro mean you came over here on a change and now you over here and here it is 2023 and you claiming everything that the white boy claimed, including the Bible. You even claiming God, you're not claiming Islamic. Did Farrakhan teach Christianity? No. Did Malcolm X teach Christianity? No. They taught Islamic. Brothers in D.C., they say we Moorish, Moorish signs. Me, I don't know who we are. You show entrepreneurship since you were a young guy. So to have a place of business is showing guys like myself that we can actually do this, you know what I'm saying? Because a lot of, uh, you wouldn't believe it, but a lot of people in Fort Worth, a lot of black people do not have businesses. They don't have buildings, they don't own anything. They're trying to, um, but you have the withstanding location um, in a city that's pretty much ran by whites. Um, what were some of the trouble that you dealt with when dealing with that? My place of business that I had to deal with my own people. And when I went to Stop Six, I knew what I was dealing with mm -hmm. because I was born and raised in Fort so I knew Stop Six. I left Stop Six. I left Stop Six in 69 and went to the South Side and opened up on the South Side all the time. So. Me being on the side side, running places of business on the side side all the time. The side side peoples are different than the stop six peoples. The side side peoples are a little bit more, a little bit more, how would you say it? A little bit more aggressive. Stop six was kind of like slow. People that never left out of stop six. The peoples from the side side, they went everywhere went downtown, took things from the white folks because back in the 60s, most people on the side side were thieves. <laughs> uh, just point blank, thieves. People on in Como, they was robbers. You know, we had different things that we did in different places. Stop Six was a culture of people that went to work every day, mostly concrete layers and things like that, you know. So me, when I went to, when I went to Classy Lady, I know that I'm dealing with some people that don't understand, so I couldn't act the same 
as I act on the south side. I had to be a little bit more humble. And then when I explain to the peoples in Stop 6, if you don't know how to act, you barred. You can't come here. I'm not going to whoop you. I'm not going to shoot you. I'm not going to let you whoop me. I'm, I'm going to bar you away from me. And then when you learn how to act, university, it's not me, it's university. Just mind your own business and don't bother nobody. Don't come in the place bothering people, trying to jump on people, you know, and things like that. You can't whoop your woman in my place. Go home and whoop your woman. You can't whoop nobody in my place. I don't have a place where you come and fight. Well, in Stop 6, that's all they want to do is fight. Hmm. You had a... Um a sign you had put up on your outside your place of business. Um, you said, explain what the sign said, Pops. I knew where I was. Mm -hmm. So I said, no gang banging aloud, my mm -hmm. Save your children's, my nigga. Well, it was a police officer seen that I had used nigga two times. So when he seen I had used two times he used to say he went to every television channel in Fort Worth and said a black man so ignorant he didn't use nigga two times. So every, telev every television channel came down the classy lady feminist and the lady saying you in trouble for using nigga. I said ma'am I am a nigga. I'm not no nigga. I'm a nigga. I am not no nigga. So I can use nigga anytime I want to use and I'm talking to the gang bangers, and I'm talking to the people just to save their children. Then I had one time on my wall, no handguns allowed, my Because every time you look up and classy lady, some, some OG want to come into place with his gun. You can't come in my place with no gun. I am scared of guns. I don't want the police in my place with guns, and I've been had a gun all my life. So I had to wrestle and take guns away from people that classy lady, not by myself. I had four or five soldiers with me down the classy lady, very strong young brothers, and they helped me with the crowd. So, Stop Six, the South Side, you've been on both sides of town. You've lived there. North Side, come on, I've been there all, all of it. So you saw the city before gangs came? I was in the penitentiary when they started gang banging. I left and went to the penitentiary in 83. When I come home from the penitentiary in 80 and 91, you can't go, black boy came, my sons, they can't come to stop six. They can't go to side side, this like this. But like I open up, you go wherever you want to go. People from stop six, People from South Side can come to Classy Lady. People from North Side can come to Classy Lady. You come to Classy Lady, I'm gonna protect you at Classy Lady. But when I come home in 91, that's gang banger. Yeah. And the way that you, the way that, the way that you stop gang banging, you give everybody, if the peoples from the South Side was going to stop six robbing the boys and stop six. The boys from Stop Six got to fight and protect themselves from the boys from the side side. But if everybody got some dope, ain't nobody gonna rob nobody. Everybody got some dope, everybody got some money. So you try to give every side of town some dope. You ain't got to worry about them robbing and fighting one another. But if side side got all the dope and no money, then boys from Stop Six got to come over and get them. They didn't have sense enough to go get white folks, rob white folks, burglarize white folks, burglarize Italian and burglarize Jews. They burglarize their own. They start taking from their own. From the 80s to now, blacks has been taken from one another. We didn't take from one another. We gave one another. We go across that railroad track and take. You ain't supposed to take, period, but we didn't have none, so you had to go take. And when you say go across the railroad tracks, you wouldn't you wouldn't steal or do anything to your own people, but you would go. Yes, 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 yes. Where well, it's plentiful. Yeah. That. I don't. The tenth commandment said you don't bother your own peoples. The tenth commandment told the Jews don't rob one another, don't fornicate with one another, but whatever you go do to them other peoples across the borders, and whatever you do to that Roman, it's all right, but you don't do it to one another. So I come up, you don't take from your own. You give your own. Blacks is my own. I love black people. I love all people, but I love my people. 
Where do you think we went wrong at, Pops? Huh? Where do you think we went wrong? You know, we ain't went wrong nowhere. We ain't really went wrong nowhere. You always got to have a leader. J. Edgar Hoover said you cannot organize the black man. A long time ago, Wall Street black man was organized. They had to be organized. But to me, what we went wrong at, and we didn't really go wrong, but Dr. King said, let's go join them. Hmm. So when we went and joined them, then we lost our businesses and we lost our culture. We went and joined them and we became them. We became that Negro, that one. Negro believe in that white boy. Negro believe in this Bible. Negro believe in whatever that white boy said. So that's where we went wrong. And Dr. King said, I led my peoples into a burning house. Now he wills believing in the white folks and the white folks done lost their house. America's been lost. Every tongue is in America now. One while there wasn't no every culture in America. One while there wasn't nobody but that white boy, that Indian, a few Mexican, few niggas, and a few Chinese. Now every culture is in America. So this is the, the Bible, y'all's book, the Bible, Revelation. Revelation, a country where everybody's at. Where's the country where everybody is? Everybody's not in North Korea. Everybody's not in Russia. Everybody's not in Cuba. Everybody's not in China. Those are communist countries. You can't come in there, but everybody's in this European country. And here we are, we on the bottom. Right today, 2023, we on the bottom. We have nothing. We don't, we don't lost sheep. We don't lost sheep. We don't even know who we are. What kind of advice would you give uh, a young black man in America today? What kind of advice would I give the young black males in America today? The ones that's able, go join the Air Force, the Army, or the Navy. Don't be scared. The ones that ain't able, go get your job. Quit trying, quit trying to rob, quit trying to steal, quit trying to sell dope. Go get you a job and be able to feed yourself and take care of yourself and get you somewhere to stay and mind your business until you die. You lost. The young black males in America today, y'all are lost. Y'all fantasize about gold. Y'all fantasize about cars. Y'all will do anything to get this money to where you can go have a good night one night at the strip club or buy you some clothes or just do this here. Go get you a job. You're going to wind up in that penitentiary and that penitentiary ain't fun. Or you're going to wind up dead. And then one thing that I see that the young black males got a bad habit of doing, whenever they kill somebody, four young brothers go to jail because there's four of them together or three of them together and they all wind up telling on one another. Mm. And the only way that the young black males can win this day and time in America is you've got to go get your job. You can't commit no crimes no more. They got cameras everywhere. They see everything that you're doing. All they don't see, the snitch gonna tell it on you. <laughs> so just go get your job, mind your business, and try not to fool with a woman with a bunch of babies. Not taking nothing from the woman because she got to have it. But when you grab a woman and she got three or four kids, you're in trouble. That's gonna take your whole check. And the only thing that the young black male can do to save himself is go get him a job where he have some interest and some benefits and just work until you die. If you open up a place of business, nobody might not come because you got to rag the building. Would you, would you say that um, being in America, a young black man, finding yourself would be the most important thing? Say it again. Finding yourself, knowing who you are, would it's hard for a black man to know who he is. It's hard for the little boys to know who they are. They have no identity to who they is because they went to school. The school didn't teach them anything. The school didn't teach the young black boys anything, neither did they want to go to school. So if you don't go to school and you don't get no education, you're going to have a the job that you're going to have ain't going to even pay you nothing, but it's going to give you something. What was your 
What was your experience like, Pops, when you went to the federal penitentiary? Ooh, that's indescribable. For a nigga like me, <laughs> that done woke up and had everything that he ever wanted and done whatever he wanted to do from the time, ever since I've been 13 years old, I wanted to be a man and been having me some money and been doing everything that I thought I wanted to do. Daddy couldn't tell me nothing no more. Grandpa couldn't tell me nothing no more because I'm grown. And I done went and learned more than they learned because they had never went nowhere to learn nothing. So I turned around and went to teaching them. So for me to go to the federal penitentiary and to have a mother wake me up every morning and with me and tell me what I can do and what I can't do and I can't go nowhere, that was a hard pill. I went crazy. I went totally insane. I went to jail in jail. I went to jail in jail because I'm one that you can't tell me nothing. I heard a story, Pop, um, while you was, and then correct me if I'm wrong, um, while you were incarcerated, you told the judge that you wasn't going to stop uh, partaking in cannabis or marijuana. I told the judge what? That you wasn't going to stop smoking weed. I didn't stop. <laughs> I smoked John, I smoked weed in the penitentiary. I found something. When I first went to the penitentiary, I'm like a ticking time bomb. Every day I'm fighting with the police. Every day I'm squabbling with the police because you can't tell me. I don't care nothing about you little old white boy. I don't care nothing about you little black boy. I don't care nothing about you warden. I don't care nothing about none of y'all. This y'all system, y'all. I don't do a guy thing y'all should do. So I put off my data many times. And I had to learn that the only way you're going to get out this penitentiary, nigga, you got to kind of cooperate and do what you got to do. So I learned to make me some money while I was in the federal penitentiary and smoke me some weed while I was in the federal penitentiary. So I'm happy every day. But one while I was a ticking time bomb in there every motherfucking day. Then I sit off in a corner and went to reading books and went to reading about every country and went to reading about every man. So when I come back out, I come out opening up places of business, getting people's jobs. When you were, when you were inside of there, um, I'm pretty sure you, you, you met a lot of young brothers that came to confide in you. I've always been the type, I'm not a follower. I've always been the type that I can stand on my own ten toes. So a lot of people just like the way that I stood on my own ten toes and they grafted to me. Mm. My name started in the federal penitentiary. It didn't start out here. My name, I'm the name, and those are my name that come in that federal penitentiary that I saw come in that federal penitentiary door that needed a little help. And I helped them because I, I'm a giver. My grandma and my mama, my, my, my grandma and my mama, they was givers. My daddy, he a cold motherfucker. But my grandma and my mama, they givers. So I wind up being a giver. I wind up having love. So how I'm gonna let one of my brothers be hungry? Oh, brother out of D.C. be hungry. Or a brother anywhere to be hungry. So we kind of like learn how to have our own in the federal penitentiary. We ain't got to buy no weed from no Mexican. We ain't got to buy no weed from no white boy. We learn how to bring our own weed in. We learn how to get our own. We learn how to open up our own store in the federal penitentiary. We learn how to run our own football thing in the federal penitentiary. What, what you mean open up a store, Pops? Huh? What you mean a store? A store? Mm-hmm. If you got a store in the federal penitentiary, you can make your thousand dollars. Cause you sell, Cokes at night, you sell honey buns at night because a lot of people get broke, so they pay a couple of stamps for some soda and things like that. Stamps is the money. So the man that run the store, he had all the stamps, so he had all the money. When he go to the commissary, he go buy a commissary for people that want something late at night because they ain't got nothing in their locker. You might want you a honey bun and a Coke. You want a honey bun and a Coke, you go to the store and get you a honey bun and a Coke. You might not have no free toes until the store open. Well, the store got some free toes, so you go get your big old bag of free toes. <laughs> Do you feel like um, when you came home that you learned your lesson? 
And I learned what? Your lesson. Ain't no lesson for me. Ain't no lesson for you. Bro. Ain't no lesson for me. <laughs> <laughs> ain't no, I'm finna die and go to hell and I ain't learned. I got old enough and wise enough to know I can't beat the feds selling dope. So mm. I quit selling dope. They got a federal agent named Floyd Garrett. He said every black man that went to the penitentiary for selling dope, when he get out to penitentiary, he gonna sell dope again. He lied. I not sell no dope no more. Why? Why did he say that? Because that's the only way we had to get us some money. We didn't have no other way to get no money. If you steal, you might come up with 3000 If you rob, you might can come up with 10000 But you can go out those every day and get you $20,000 if you got the right kind of dope. If you got some good boy and you got some good girl, you can go out those and you can come back in the house. You got you $20,000. So why am I ain't going to try to do that? And really, it ought to be legal. White boy sold us. Which where, one is wrong? Where the dope come from, Pop? Huh? Where does the dope come from? Where was it coming from? America said the drugs is a con controlled substance. Well, if it's a controlled substance, how did y'all let it in America? So if it get to America, we got a right to sell it. Mm -hmm. So foreign countries, just like we sell guns to countries, we sell ships to countries. People sell dope. Hmm. To us. To us. Yeah. Brazilian Indians are rich now. Why? That's where the cocaine come from. The cocaine tree come from Brazil. And the paste is shipped to Colombia. And Colombia bring the dope to Europe and sell it all over Europe. So now Brazil is rich. Hmm. China, been selling China white, I don't know how long in America. That is, fentanyl. Fentanyl now, where fentanyl come from? Fentanyl come from China. China produced fentanyl that's killing mother killing everybody. Every country got something to sell. Every nation got something to sell, except us. The old blacks used to grow food and sell food on the farms. Now we don't have nothing because the young blacks, when their grandpas and grandmas died, they sold the land. They don't grow no food no more, so we're in trouble. We don't have anything. You got to manufacture something. You got to produce something. You got to grow something. What other way do a black man have any money besides going to work? You can't get rich going to work. That check going to just pay your bills. You ain't got no extra money. People want extra money. Some people go get a part-time job for extra money. Some blacks are strong enough. We go to penitentiary and we come right back out and we do sell dope because we got to pay them bills. We want that lifestyle. If you want that lifestyle, you got to do what you got to do. You mentioned earlier, Pops, that um, black people selling dope in comparison to white people sold us. Which one is worse? Um, could you explain your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that, a black man done found something that he can sell to get him some money and ain't got to kiss your Now you want to send him to jail. You sold my ancestors. Which one is the worst? Hmm. You made money off of my ancestors. You made a good mandingo nigga, three or four women on the plantation, mama, auntie, whatever, and make babies. And then you sold them babies. So what's wrong with a black man selling some dope in America and you let it come in America? Mm. Black man ain't got no ships to go get it and he found a way to make him some extra money. It's a lot of squares sold some dope, they got away with it. The ones that sold the dope and had to go buy the pretty cars and wear the pretty gear and things like that, white boy couldn't stand that so he sent his to jail. Took all his dope, took all his money away from him, took his cars away from him and sent his ass to jail. That's the enjoyment that the fed get. Do you feel like letting the dope come in, allowing us to sell it enough to then, when we get flashy, they put us in jail? So, was that part of the program to get the black man out of the home? The black man is out of the home, period, because he can't feed the home. Hmm. So a woman don't want a man that can't feed her and he won't go get no job. The white boy is not designed 
to make the black boy rich to where he can enjoy his life. Just like I said, a black Cuban and a white Cuban is the same. But if you white and you black in America, white don't like black. And black don't have anything to be equal. How can he be equal and he don't have nothing? From slavery to now. How can he be equal to a white boy? You still can't be equal. And then what the black woman said, white boy don't owe you nothing. Yeah, they do. Owe me to leave me alone, let me give me some money and don't f with me talking about he gonna send me to jail because I'm getting him some money. Then nobody sent him to jail and he took this mother from the Indian and put his Republican game down, his Democrat game and his private party or whatever, the independent party. It's a game. And the white boy run America, but the white boy done lost America. It's a game, and the black boy lose because he don't... How can he fight back? How can he fight back? And here y'all come. Y'all fighting one another. Y'all ain't thinking about the white boy. Y'all went to school with him. Y'all got his education. Y'all supposed to be fooling with him and getting the money from him. Y'all supposed to be fooling with the white girl getting the money, but y'all just get a white girl, y'all and don't get no money. Stupid. So you just want to be seen or you want to be heard. I want to help my little brothers. I want to help my little brothers where they don't have to struggle and have to fight one another. I win, so why I wouldn't want to help somebody else? They taught me, help your people. I had a partner. An older man, he said, if a man's pants is tow, he said, what do you do? I said, you saw him. He said, no, you just tear him off of him. So I wind up being opposite of him. If your pants is tow, I either buy you a pair or sew them for you. I want everybody to know what I know. My uncle used to get mad at me because when he teach me something, I teach it to another brother. Hmm. He said, man, I didn't give you this to get to him. But I want everybody to have money. If everybody got money, it make my job easier. If I'm the only one got some money, now you looking at me trying to figure out how to take my money, and I'm going to pop you in your ass. OK, Pops. Thank you for your time on the Bob Report. And we'll see you next time, Pops. <laughs> All right, young man, have a blessed day. Yeah, for real. Hey, real tone, it's the real money in the room.